Fire Connect resource. Growing healthy churches. Is in relationship for God's mission. Well, thanks everyone for listening in to this podcast. Uh, and I'm here with Alex Harris. And Alex is going to be our guest speaker at our SCBA Leaders Day on November the 9th. Uh, and it's going to be, we're looking forward to it, Alex. Good, good. I'm looking forward to it as well. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining me this afternoon for, for a conversation with Joth. How are you doing? Uh, very well, thank you. Yeah, no, it's really good to join you. I'm very happy to chat a little bit on uh, podcast, videocast. And uh, I, as I said, Joth, I'm, I am delighted. I, it's a real privilege to be invited to uh, spend some of the day with you guys in November. So I'm hoping that I can serve you well and encourage you and uh, yeah, help out as best I can. So Alex, it'd be, it'd be really good just to get to know you a little bit. So let me ask you a question about yourself. If, uh, if someone asked you for three words to describe you, what three words would you use? Uh, excellent question. Unprompted. What people probably would say about me would be energetic, uh, focused, and I hope they might say fun, perhaps. Maybe, maybe there'd be three that I'd go with. I might go home and ask my wife later, see what she says. Oh, we don't mind fun. Fun would be good. That that would be great. If you bring a bit of fun to our Leaders' Day, we'll look forward to that. I'll do my best. <laughs> so what's your favourite food? Uh, favourite food? We spent, uh, that's easy for me, we spent about six years uh, living in China. So without doubt, uh, proper Chinese, not, not English Chinese, uh, but proper Chinese, uh, authentic Chinese, uh, it leads the way by a mile. Not least, I love the food, but not least because it brings out all the memories of uh, life there and living there and all that kind of stuff, you know, that comes. So, uh, yeah, so Chinese food would probably lead the way. My favourite restaurant, without a doubt, though, is a little place called Wagamama's, where it's a chain. It's all over the place, but I do like a good Wagamama's. Not least, we have a whole fleet of children. So um, not least because they do probably the best kids' meals uh, anywhere so uh, uh, there's a little wagamama's advert put in there uh, it's a good place that place i think you've been sponsored by them well i hope for a discount if uh, if someone from wagamama's hears this then just send me a note 10 percent discount let, let me uh, get a little bit deeper with you then um what's your greatest frustration in life yeah so to be honest I think it's, it would definitely be, well, what immediately comes to mind, Josh, without doubt, is that my family aren't saved. So I come from an absolutely fantastic, brilliant family, great mum, great dad, an older brother, two younger sisters, like an amazing place to grow up there. I'm, I'm privileged with the family, full of love, full of discipline. I know that's not everyone's experience, but it was mine. I'm really thankful for it. Um, but they, did, they don't know Jesus. I grew up without, I never went to church. I was about 16. I went to a wedding when I was 16. And other than that, I, I never went to church till I was about 21, never stepped in a church building, not through school, not through family, not through anything, never encountered Jesus. Knew one teacher in my sixth form who was a Christian, but that was the only conscious uh, relationship I had with a Christian was that one teacher through to 21. So without doubt, the, the thing that really burns on my heart, that frustration, um, sometimes wrongly boiling over into anger at God, but certainly frustration, it's come on Jesus, you know, why, why won't your Holy Spirit just work in my mum and dad's life, in my siblings' life, and just, just win them to, to Jesus? So that, 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 without a doubt, the instinctive response to that question, Joth, without doubt, the biggest frustration is just not seeing my folks, my mum and dad, um, you know, those I love the most, um, see Jesus for all that he is. I mean, that, that just hangs, there's another question that hangs there then, because if you were brought up in that kind of context, that family that didn't know the Lord, how, how did you come to know Jesus? Uh, yeah, no, good question. So I was probably about 19, 20. Uh, I was um, a Royal Marine in, in something similar to the reserves as it is now. Um, it, it doesn't exist now, but it was similar to what the reserves are now. And also studying for a degree, kind of doing those two things in parallel. And for the first time, really, I, I met Christians. I met people who were, I was aware were Christians and they were really good um, like really good guys like I loved hanging out with them they were good friends I enjoyed their company but there was something like I remember one guy called Paul a friend of mine called Paul and uh, we used to play a load of sport together and he'd play hard he'd, he'd hit the tackles hard um, he was a really good player um, but he was also very open about being a Christian he was very um, unself-effacing about it you know it was just natural to who he was um, and, and, and he was a Christian and I remember one night Joth 
Actually, it's just it just comes into my mind. I remember one night particularly. It was probably the end of season kind of bash, you know, the big celebration. All, all the ladies were dressed up in beautiful dresses, the men in their, um, you know, bow ties and, and cover bands and all looking smart. And my friend Paul had come along and we happened to be sitting at the same table, probably eight of us at the same table. And he'd had a couple of pints, but he hadn't got drunk. It was part of it. Uh, and then the strippers that we'd hired came on. And my friend Paul, he just stood up, didn't make a big fuss about it. He just stood up from the table and he said, lads, I, I don't want anything to do with this. I'll be back in half an hour, but I don't want anything to do with this. And, and he walked out the room and I don't know if you can imagine it, Joff, but like the whole place, we started bang, just our table first, started banging on the table. We were yelling at him. And then the whole place was just shouting at him as he walked out. And, you know, on the outside, giving him all this, all this jip. And yet on the inside, I was, wow. Wow, just I mean, just blown away that he could live like that. I just found it incredibly attractive. And I, I actually followed him out. Um, I, I waited a little bit until no one noticed. They just thought I was going to the loo or something. But then I, I followed him out and I found him fair enough. He was just standing outside, chatting on his phone to someone. I don't know what. He was planning to come back in half an hour itself. That's amazing, isn't it? He was going to walk back into that space. And I remember talking to him. And uh, the next day, another friend of ours, at uh, his prompting, gave me a Bible and I, at that point, I just then became infatuated with Jesus. I just read and read the Bible. No one told me how to read it. So I just started at Genesis and just read through, you know, pay, you know slowed up a bit in Numbers and Leviticus, but plowed on. But I, I read this thing, probably, I probably read it through three or four times in that first term of kind of university. Just, I, and particularly Jesus, just infatuated with Jesus, just amazed at the kind of man he was, at, at the people who gathered around him, the breadth of people who gathered around him and found incredible. Um, and just some point in, in all of that, by God's Holy Spirit, Jesus just walked off the pages of the Bible at some point. I couldn't pin it down to a certain moment. Um, but at some point he just walked out and, and I didn't have the language. I didn't have Lord. I didn't have Savior. I remember saying to someone, look, I've just decided he's the man I'm going to follow. I can trust him to lead my life. And I'm totally convinced that he's rescued me from the brokenness that lives in my life. You know, I had ruler and rescuer as words to describe Jesus. I didn't have the religious language of Savior and, and Lord. I just had ruler and rescuer um, and friend, actually, and brother, you know, the, and, and mm -hmm. comrade, you know, and, and all this kind of um, just trust and confidence in Jesus as he walked off the pages. So so there were, there were the two things, the, the, the power of, of simple living for Jesus in the everyday in my friend Paul and just how profound that impact was on me and then the centrality of, of God's word does God's work by God's spirit you know Jesus is made alive it's the road to Emmaus isn't it it's just there it's the, the word of God and your heart just turns in you as Jesus is just made alive through that so there'd be lots more I could say about that but actually I should say as well that the, the friend who gave me that first bible so Paul was the prompt he got another friend of ours she was called Hannah we are now married and have four kids so I think I think there was some hormones going on in God's mix as well uh motivating me to take that bible but yeah yeah so that, there's some of the story Joff already that's, that's a, oh, I love that that's, what a wonderful story and it's great that you found found the Lord but also found your wife at the same time so that's uh fantastic there's a double bonus uh, Joff I have to say I asked her out so I asked her out I was, I was I was in this reading the bible intrigue this kind of three six month window of this journey of meeting Jesus and I asked Hannah out you know I took a fancy to her and she turned around to me she said Alex I, I really would like to go out with you as well but there's another man in my life who says I shouldn't and I assumed she meant her dad I assumed she was talking about her father um, but she's, then she turned around and said his name's Jesus and until you can follow him then I'm not going to trust you with my heart so she's quite an amazing woman actually I have to, I have to say and that probably delayed me, at least delayed me publicly saying I'd come to trust Jesus for quite a while because then I became slightly sort of almost paranoid, you know, that I was going to choose Jesus because I wanted Hannah to choose me. Um, yes. But yeah, so it was, it was all kind of wrapped up in in in, yeah, in the same moment, meeting Hannah, meeting Jesus, you know, it was all, it, yeah, in God's kindness, so we're all interconnected. I was going to ask you, because I asked you what your frust most greatest frustration was. I was going to ask you what your greatest passion was, but I kind of think I know what the answer is. But but do you have a, a, another passion other than Jesus and Hannah? What what would be your third? <laughs> no, I, I yeah, I, I love Jesus. I love Hannah. I love the boys. I love I love family. 
Um, we have we happen to have four boys, but you know our kids. You know I love all of that. Um, I love training working dogs. So we have a little spaniel called Buddy. So I really enjoy kind of training dogs to to kind of do a bit of work. Um, you know I've explored and and you know um, taking on dogs for a year or so, and then they go on to become assistance dogs or something like that. So you put the basic training work in and and that kind of stuff. So you know I, I love that. I love running. Um, I actually had about 10 years where I couldn't run because of a major issue with my leg and they, they, I had surgery about 18 months ago now which seems to have, I mean, almost in the miraculous category to me, seems to have rectified that. But I like good TV as well, Joff. I, I'm, I, I, I don't think it's good just to, just to switch your head off when you watch, but I, I love really thought-provoking um, uh, series, you know, fictional stuff, but I love the stuff that get, you know, just kind of, just really engages you so these things I'm going to mention a couple they won't be everyone's cup of tea and some might some people as Christians wouldn't choose to watch them you know but more recently The Handmaid's Tale so uh, uh, Margaret Atterwood is that right I forget her surname properly now but it, the book is amazing but it's just been made into a series there's a lot of thought provoking stuff in that um, I love the West Wing you know I'd revisit the West Wing anytime good old Jed Bartlett and and his gang um, you know stuff like that that just is a little bit more there's a little, there's a bit of meat on the bones and I love that kind of good TV I'm quite passionate about that as well so there's there's some you know third fourth and fifth place stuff as well <laughs> I was fascinated with the dogs what are you training the dogs for Oh, and that, I, I do it for fun and just just to get me out and about and just to give a different focus and a different. Um... Oh right, it sounded like you were training them for the police or something. I know, but no, uh, like we've taken a few which have then gone on to be like assistance dogs or something like that. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, like uh, to work with children who have autism, uh, companion dogs, and things. Yeah. But our actual pet dog, who's with me now, he's fast asleep just on the floor down here, is a little black cocker spaniel. Um, who the boys wanted to call Sir Grunkle Nuts the Brave, but I could not bring myself. I just imagined myself at the park shouting, Sir Grunkle Nuts! And I thought, <laughs> it's not going to happen, is it? So we've heard a bit about your, your story in terms of how you became a Christian. How long have you been in ministry, in terms of church ministry? Um, so, I mean, it's frighteningly, it's probably the best part of two decades, maybe even a bit longer. So being called to Jesus, for me, being called to Jesus and being called to or compelled to proclaim Jesus, they were they were wrapped up hand in hand as well, Joff, together, I have to say. So I actually preached my first sermon before being saved. Again, I didn't I didn't know the rules, so I didn't know that you didn't do that. Um, but basically, on the university campus oh, I was not? on, there, 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 there was this mission week going on, you know, UCCF, I think it was, but, you know, one of these mission weeks or event weeks, as they're more called nowadays, and uh, I was excited. To, I was learning about Jesus. I knew I wasn't trusting him. And I was excited to take my friends to learn about Jesus. So I was rolling into these evening events with the whole of my rugby team. The whole squad would come, you know, 30, 40 lads would, would roll into these, these events. And I realized now in hindsight, if you're like the, the, the person running a missions week and you've got this guy bringing 30 of his non-Christian mates, you just assume this guy is on fire for Jesus, don't you? You know, I was, I was just, come on lads, this will be good. I'll buy you a beer afterwards, let's go and do it. And about halfway through the week, the guy, Ken, who was the speaker of this event, Ken Cowan, who was a UCCF team leader at the time, he said to me, oh, Alex, you know, um, how about at the start, you just tell us a little bit about your favorite Bible verse and what Jesus means to you. I'll do the proper sermon, Alex, but you speak for 10 minutes about the favorite Bible verse and what you, and I was like, yeah, I can do that. And so I remember standing up to do it. All my rugby mates are there, the hall's full of people, whatever, and Ken's sitting on the front row. And I began by saying, um, so Ken's asked me to speak tonight. I'm not actually a Christian, but, and I could, and Ken's face just like collapsing in on itself. And I'm looking at him going, what have I said that's wrong? You know, I've obviously clearly said some horrendous, heinous thing because his face kind of said it all. But yeah, um, uh, and then I went on. But ironically, uh, Joff, is, is a, guy, a friend of mine called Martin. We're still really good friends now, actually. Se big second row forward, six foot four, massive, massive, huge lock. Um, he was converted that night. He's still going strong for Jesus now. Um, and, uh, he became a Christian that evening, which, which is just awesome. But anyway, there was this compulsion, this realisation, I guess, in my own heart, Joff, that if I was to choose to follow Jesus, he would call me to proclaim him in some way, shape or form. Again, I didn't have language. I didn't know what ministers or vicars or I didn't have language for any of this kind of stuff. After uni, 
uh, I spent a year as an apprentice at a church in Cambridge working with students there uh, which was my desire there was to kind of fast forward my education I was, I was acutely aware having not been brought up in a Christian family that lots of my peers you know were way ahead of me in their in their understanding of Jesus and I just wanted to know him better so I'd, I thought I'll do a year apprenticeship you know at this church then I was asked by an organization Christians in Sport whether I'd spend three or four years as an itinerant evangelist basically in their university work so um, again I, I did that uh, always still thinking it wouldn't be a forever career always thinking um, you know I'd, I'd actually at that point was thinking about water engineering I grew up in West Africa my dad was a diplomat and I wanted to go back to Africa as a water engineer so these were all kind of stop gaps before the real thing started um, but then I ended up with Christians in Sport for about eight years um, and that took us to China. So we were based in China with Christians in Sport for a big chunk of that. We got married straight from uni, so Hannah and I were married by this point. Eldest child was born in China. Um, what began kind of as, as missionary work, I guess you'd call it, in China, we ended up in Shanghai. I was working for a big international church in Shanghai as one of their associate staff. And that's really when God kind of said, actually, Alex, it, you've done this now for 10 years it, this is not your temporary stopgap before the main thing that you know this is what I want you doing and we had a big decision to make Joth do we stay in China um, or do we come back to the UK I'd done a bachelor's in theology just for fun in my spare time <laughs> um, over this period so I had my original bachelor's uh, and then I, I had this bachelor's in theology but we, we felt God saying actually the gospel is spreading fast in China I want you back in the UK uh, and doing some gospel work in the UK. Um, and then there was a bit of a journey, a, a, a theologically Baptist more than any kind of historical kind of thing. So that brought us into the Baptist kind of family, Baptist together, did a master's at Spurgeon's, you know, so we came back to the UK, um, paid ourselves, to, pay, paid our way to do a master's. We had a couple of children, more children during the master's period at Spurgeon's. Um, and then came up here to Stafford 2012. So I've been here uh, eight years, just moving into year nine uh, here at the Beacon in, in Stafford. So sorry, that I've meandered along a bit there, Joff, but that, there's, there's some. No, we've got, we got, we got the full picture now, the full picture of your whole life, really. Um, so so you arrive, you arrive at Stafford. What, what, did the Beacon exist? or? or yeah, yeah. Did? So it was called Sand and Road Baptist Church really healthy when I arrived, like really healthy church, relatively, size is not a measure of value, doesn't matter, but a smaller, if you like, community, about 35 people when we came, um, felt very strongly called by God that this was the place for us. Felt we had to marry the church, so even though our arrival meant the church would go run out of money in about 21 months, we felt we had to really commit, so we bought a house here and kind of basically said, in 21 months time if the money runs out I'm still going to be the pastor of this church I'll just have to go by vocational I'll just have to go work at Tesco's or something um, but really healthy about mission about wanting to reach people about discipleship and all that kind of stuff uh, and then we just had an amazing eight years of God just being incredibly gracious to us incredibly kind to us um, and uh, you know I hope the church is just as healthy as it was then but um, it, you know there's a lot more of us which is just amazing God has just grown the family um, and part of that journey was naming ourselves Beacon Church as more helpful for the community around us uh, to understand what we we're about as a church um, and, and, and who we were. Uh, yeah, and it's been tremendous, Joff, it's been tremendous. So on your website, you describe Beacon as one church, many congregations. So well, you talk, talk me through some of the congregations that there are as part of the church. Yeah, so we're nine congregations now, which is brilliant. Um, so, uh, and we have uh, a five, four slash five buildings, depending on how you want to sort of count um, in terms of what's going on. Uh, so, and they're all different shapes and sizes. So what unites us is a set of values. You know, what who we are is this, this, this is who God is making us. This is who we are, identity, a, a set of values. And then we really want to just release people to go and reach people who don't know Jesus, grow as disciples and catalyze 
congregations for them to flourish in and grow in. And we try and keep congregations small. We talk about 100 max principle, so never more than about 100 adults, um, often quite a bit smaller. Um, we want them to be small enough to care, but big enough to dare. That's one of our little mottos, that there's, an, there's a smallness to them for the intimacy, the love, the compassion, the togetherness that's needed. Small enough to care, but big enough, or at least confident enough to dare to take risks in mission, to take risks to reach people, you know, supported, you know, especially the smaller ones, can do things which they could have never imagined because they're part of the wider family, the Beacon family. So two are on new housing estates. We've had the privilege of buying houses, big houses on brand new housing estates and moving an evangelist in and starting a church from scratch within the developing community. One's called Pub Church. Uh, we actually were back in physical space for Pub Church last night. We call it Spiritual Cafe. The pub is really big into clairvoyancy, really big into into kind of Ouija boards. So we do Spiritual Cafe. And, uh, you know, we say, yeah, actually, there is a God who knows your future. There is a God who's going to walk and journey alongside you. And you meet him in Jesus. So let, let, let us show you him in the Bible. Let us sing songs about this God. Let us, let us pray for you and see if he'll come and heal your situation. And, you know, we had a huge turnout last night um, uh, in terms of, you know, what God was doing about people who had never come near anything related to church but are deeply drawn to Jesus. So that's in a pub. One speaks Chinese. One is for those who have Chinese as their mother language. Um, a couple are, a couple look like more traditional or classic church expressions on a Sunday morning. Um, so all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Um, and we're saying, let's reach people for Jesus. Let's grow as disciples. Let's catalyze new churches, new congregations for people to grow in. Um, and, and, and I believe no church is actually a church. I don't believe the Bible tells us to plant churches. The Bible tells us to plant movements, um, movements of disciples. And if, if, if you do that, churches will be spawned. Um, because that's what you need for them to grow healthy and, and, and catalyze new ones. So that's sort of what, what we're about in a nutshell. Very messy around the edges, um, very undefined in places that perhaps we should be much better defined in, uh, very empowering of people. We give away an awful lot of responsibility uh, and authority, um, and that has challenges and problems, but it is beautiful um, in terms of mission and discipleship. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's sort of who we are, roughly. So, you, so you, I would have thought if you had nine congregations to be considering and, and caring for, you wouldn't have time to start something else. But you know, fire started, and you called it fire started, fire starters. Sorry. Um, yeah. What, what 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 was the background to that? What was the inspiration? Yeah. So fire starters. It's not a beacon thing. It's not a beacon church thing. We're just one of a number who are just loving working together in that so basically probably four years ago I forget now um, uh, with the help of Baptists together the request of Baptists together and the wonderful help of Baptists together uh, we got together just a handful of leaders of Baptist churches that were experiencing really surprising growth conversion kingdom growth uh, and it started just with five or six, just got together in a room up here in Stafford. And it was just to share stories, really, and support each other and and hear from one another a little bit of what God was doing. And and then about six months later, we we did it again. But we said, why don't we gather some of our emerging leaders? So probably that that was a room full of 40 or 50 people gathered again, only for even then, only from about eight or nine churches. Mostly most of those churches growing pretty fast and, and just bringing some of our younger leaders together for, for a couple of days. And, and what happened very organically, no one planned it. I certainly didn't plan it. It wasn't in my mind. Um, and again, with the strong prompting of Baptists together, who, by the way, I, I just think I love being far, part of the Baptist family. I just think it's absolutely awesome for mission. I love our regional association set up. I love our regional ministers. I, I, Lynn uh, Green, she's just amazing. I'm a huge, huge fan of the network, the family we call Baptists together. Um, but with their prompting, they said, look, would you just host a couple of conversations around the country where two or three or four of these faster growing churches just tell their story of what God is doing in our Baptist family? One of the things we're not so good at as Baptists is we're not so good at telling the whole story. We're very good at, at, at like, woe is me, times are tough, isn't it difficult? We're not so, which is true. We're not so good at telling the equally true story of, wow, God is at work in our family. We don't have to look at other tribes actually within our own baptist together family god is at work in unusual ways and so we started just hosting these very simple conversations where some stories were told some questions were asked some discussions were had some prayers were said 
Um, and out of that came the Firestarter Network. And what, what we're praying for, our prayer goal, no one's paid, no one's got a job, it's not a charity, it's not registered, it's just this thing that we're doing. Um, but our prayer is that a hundred Baptist Together churches would see twice the number of baptisms in the year after as the five years before one of these conversations. And we've been praying that for about two years and we've, we know of 73 churches now that have come to a fire starter conversation and off the back of the year following they've seen twice as many baptisms as the five years prior to, to that moment. It's very organic, it's very relational, it's about, very much about connecting people together and, and letting Holy Spirit do his work through them. Um, it's not about having answers to questions, it is about having learnt lessons and telling stories and just encouraging each other that God is at work. Um, and there's some principles we've learned, which we might unpack um, in a moment if you want to ask about the day in November. But there's some principles we've learned. Uh, but yeah, but it's, it's softer than that, in a sense. Cheers, Alex. That's really good to hear that. And uh, great to hear 73 churches seeing conversions and baptisms in that way. Um, so you're going to join us on the 9th of November, which we're looking forward to. And you're going to bring some of your energy and some of your fun to that day, I'm sure. Uh, we're going to be uh, virtual, but uh, it's going to be great to see you regardless. Um, but can you, are you able to give us a bit of a taster of what you think you might be sharing with us? You don't have to say too much at this point, but just enough to wet, wet our appetites. I think so. I mean, I've prayed about this and, and you and I, Geoff, have had a little chat about this and I've said I'll, I'll run some more material past you really because my heart is just to serve in the best possible way your leaders, you know, in terms of whatever is helpful. And I'm not going to claim to come with answers. I, you know, I want to be absolutely clear that, there's no, you know, I'm not coming with any answers, but I hope, hope some encouragement, hope some good things to think about. So I want to get us in the Bible, Geoff. So number one, I'll definitely get us in the Bible. God's work, word does God's work through God's spirit. So I'm praying hard in terms of that particular word that he might want to bring. Um, you know, so there's definitely that. The second thing, though, Joth, is I, w I do want to bring those principles. There's seven recurring themes from these fast growing churches that they all have and yet are a little bit unique to growing churches. They're not found in others, but they are consistently found in these seven. So there's some collective wisdom that I'll, I'll be sharing um, from these faster growing churches. There's seven principles that I think are well worth reflecting on and pondering for every church just to seek what God might be saying through them. So I'll, secondly, I'll bring those seven principles. And thirdly, at your request, but I think this is important, I, I will just share much more personally some of my own journey through COVID, um, how I've experienced that as a leader, and I found it incredibly difficult. You know, I'll be open enough to say I've never been someone who's who's found my mental or emotional well-being challenged. I have over this last six months. Um, I found that quite difficult, the realisation of that. So I, I, there are some of my own journeys over COVID I'd like to just share and reflect on. But also within that, to look beyond COVID and say, actually, you know, what, you know, we need to start just talking about what church looks like post-COVID. You know, and, and have we learned the things that God would want us to learn through this about how we can be more effective for his kingdom? Again, I'm not going to say I have any answers at all, but I, I would I would hope I could start to provoke some more conversations. There'll be one voice in the conversation of what are the lessons we need to learn through COVID. So three things, a word from the Bible, essential. We're not Christians if we don't gather around his word and under his word. And um, secondly, those seven principles collectively learned through the fast growing churches of Firestarter and thirdly, some reflections off the COVID um, experience. Alex, that sounds really great. Uh, I'm sure many, many will be looking forward to hearing more about that and finding out what those seven principles are. So we won't tell them yet. They're after turn up to find out. Um, Alex, thanks for sharing your story. It's great to hear what God has done in your life. Great to hear how God is continuing to do great things through your ministry, but others that you're working alongside and other congregations through Fire Starters as well. Fantastic to hear that. Uh, good to hear about what your loves, your joys are, what your passions are, and a bit about your frustrations as well, and get to know you a little bit. And we'll look forward on the nights of learning a little bit more about you, but also what God is doing through you and what God has placed on your heart to share with us on that occasion so bless you thanks so much for your time and thanks for all the preparation you're going to put into this ready for the day my absolute pleasure Geoff really is
by a connect resource. Growing healthy churches. It's in relationship for God's mission.